Sysdig is the first cloud-native visibility and security platform that eliminates the need for standalone tools like container security and monitoring. Using Sysdig's unique data approach, enterprises can solve a variety of visibility and security issues at massive enterprise scale for multi- and hybrid cloud environments. Sysdig will enable your organization to scan and block vulnerable images and enforce best practices pre-production, block threats, enforce compliance, and monitor application performance, proactively alert on incidents, reduce MTTR with forensics, and capture detailed audit records, all from a single unified platform. Accelerate your transition to containers and then have confidence in your ongoing operations using Sysdig. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com forward slash Sysdig. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. I'm your host, Mike Shima, joined by Matt Alderman and John Kinsella. Some of you told us that you are overwhelmed by the amount of content we distribute. In an attempt to make it a little easier for you to find what you're interested in, we've created our new listener interest list. Sign up for the list and select your interest by visiting securityweekly.com slash subscribe and clicking the button to join the list. You can also now submit your suggestions for guests in our recently released guest suggestion form. Go to securityweekly.com slash guests and enter your suggestions. Security Weekly will be at Hacker Halted in Atlanta, Georgia this October 10th and 11th. EC Council is offering our listeners a 15% discount to sit for any of their bootcamp courses or workshops. Visit securityweekly.com slash hacker halted to register now. So Matt, John, we just had a great conversation about DevOps teams and team organization team structure. I was curious if we could maybe turn our focus on to the code and what the pro and the products that DevOps teams are building in the sense of APIs. And API security, I think, has emerged and separated, but you know, bifurcated. Well, that'll be our callback word for the show, Matt, um, from web security in the last couple of years. Um, so you actually have an OWASP top 10 for web, as well as you have an OWASP top 10 for API, um, as well as we have web scanners, uh, which are near and dear to my heart, as well as API scanners. Um, so let's set the stage there. And I'm curious what, a, what, what speaks to you from an API um, security perspective? So this is a problem I started researching back when I was at Tenable a few years back when we saw the the technology trend and kind of what was happening to applications, containerization, microservices, and we started thinking about, well, wait a minute, if all these applications are distributed microservices made up of containers, then the proliferation of APIs is going to explode, right? We have all these connections between these microservices through APIs. And so the thought process back then was, how are we going to solve the API security problem? How are we going to first identify which APIs we have? What functionality do those APIs have? How do we potentially secure or protect those APIs? And, and the, the, the really simple one for me is think about all the applications running on our smartphones. We have an application on our phone that creates an API connection back to a web service to look up data, access your bank accounts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how we communicate now, right? I mean, that, that's how we're doing a lot of our work from our phones. And how secure is that API connection from that app on your phone to that backend web service, let alone all the APIs that sit behind that front end that you're communicating to with all the APIs that sit behind those microservices, right? So. This is, to me, a really, really big problem, and, it, and it, to me, it breaks down to a couple different problems. One is discovery. What APIs do I have? I, I think most organizations don't really understand their APIs, which ones are public, which ones are not supposed to be public, and, and where they are and what they communicate to. So I think there's a huge challenge with just understanding that kind of asset discovery of APIs and the visibility into them let alone all the things that follow, which is secure communication. Is it encrypted? What are the potential issues around um, certs and signing? And, and just the expansion of all that, right? Yeah, I think that to, to pick up on those last couple points, you know, we've talked here on the show a couple different times about 
um, service to service authentication, open source tools like um, that, have, uh, that that are available for doing that. that these are fundamental problems that you know companies are solving and fortunately starting to share as open source. But on the other hand, um, you know, coming from that, the, the technical aspects of just where are all of your APIs and just that basic asset inventory, um, crawling a web application is a lot more gnarly to try to get through to set up different states. And APIs are, in a way, are almost self-documenting. They are essentially, here, is, here are the properties, here are the methods I offer. This is how to interact with them. Go forth and conquer. So ostensibly, there should be a way to enumerate them more easily, but there's still no great tool, and that's still a challenge for even you know small and medium orgs, let alone larger ones. But even when you start to even know where those API endpoints are, it's still hard to figure out how to test them. So that's where just that fuzzing comes in. And we've seen, I think, a lot of great work um, with fuzzing on um, like mobile apps, as going and how mobile apps are interacting with local APIs and even syscalls, same with um, something like Flash and how it is interacting with a browser and with local um, uh, file system. Um, so that's a way to go. And I think that's where we're going to have to see API fuzzing go or API testing go. Um, because it's really hard to figure out what is the state you need to set up and what's the sequence of events that you need to know to say this API endpoint needs to be called before this one and then this other one. But if you call this one, then you can also now do these three in a row and you have this really interesting state machine that you need to re kind of reverse engineer and test for when you go through and do this from a security perspective. Not easy, but it's a fun problem, I would say. I think, Mike, Mike I, I liked how you actually sort of led us into this conversation. Um, you know, just thinking through the history, uh, I don't know, say what, 10 years ago, when APIs first started becoming uh, a little more of that, that pattern of, you know, separation between web and, and backend through a clean API, not just, you know, a bunch of CGI calls. Um, I think for those doing pen tests at that point in time, it, it, it was a field of goodies, right? Because you very quickly realize as you, 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 and run around that web UI, which they wanted you to test. You go straight to the API, you grab a copy of Burp Suite, Burp Suite you start banging on that, and you know your you've, your reports grow in pages by the second. Um, and then over time, that sort of it's improved out, and we've gotten a lot better, and we're coming closer to what you guys are now talking about. Um, I think and again, this comes back to the uh, an established org versus a new project. So the stuff again, I was working on this weekend. I'm I'm I sat down with intentions to. Uh, do the Go microservices for a standard, you know, REST API. Uh, and then as I was Googling around, I saw this. And by the way, guys, this is what I do when I come off a 16-hour flight from India. There's something wrong with me. I sit down and start playing <laughs> code. Um, and God, my wife is patient enough, too. But anyways, um, yeah, so I started looking at GraphQL, and then I started thinking about how do you authenticate these things, and, and you start going down this path. And so really where I'm going with this, let's see, a few different comments here. I saw something really great, and I'll try to get the URL over to you, Mike, so we can put it in. Um, one of the projects I saw out there on a REST API, they were actually going through, as part of their codes, they would add in um, API. As you'd say, you'd have like what? Um, slash v2, slash donkey, slash get, and all your verbs. They'd also have one in there that would say schema. So you'd actually be able to iterate through the schema as you went through that way. So that's one way of doing it. Um, my preference for the last few years is to be using something like an open API or Swagger, where your mm -hmm. library is actually built by, by documenting the code. Um, and, and then sort of to, to move this in a, a slightly different direction, or we don't have to do it immediately. But one of the things, the questions, you know, Matt, we were getting asked this at the end of Laird Inside, and we still get this question occasionally now, is as people are going more and more to real microservices in a, uh, some type of a containerized environment, where the microservice might be talking to an API and it different either a cluster or it could be a different company. How do you check the security of that? How do you know he should be making that call that you're not making an invalid call, not just trusting the other side's authentication and authorization to be able to enforce that, but how do you do it back on your side of the fence as well? 
for an outcome. That's a great point because we talk about like the the recent movement as well to like, here's what zero trust is or beyond core mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call that. That's that user kind of focus, but that means that here's a user node endpoint that's their laptop, their phone, and their browser talking to some service. And what you said there at the very end there, John, you know, integrating with sort of APIs to other companies is really also what Matt called out too, is like, at what point do you even know that this API is public or private? Um, do you even need private APIs? Or do you even have like, do you have the maturity of the org to be able to say, all of our APIs are actually going to be public by design and intention, whether it's to integrate with another company. And then we have to hope somehow that our data is not then being exfiltrated and then leaked and abused via some other third party service. But we also need some strong authentication and sort of, I guess, where I'm going, going with this is we have that concept of zero trust for the end user and client attestation. But I don't know that we have that similar confidence yet or, you know, that open API th that we have or swagger to be able to self-document to also self-attest that says, yeah, you could probably trust me. Go ahead, you know, give me some authentication tokens or give me that OAuth token that's nice, widely scoped, or hey, I'm just gonna extract some data and then don't worry about what I do with it over here behind the scenes. Yeah, there is one of our sponsors on Enterprise Security Weekly is Edgewise, who's actually trying to do this at the application layer, right? This zero trust around the application. Is this app supposed to talk to these other applications? I don't think it's as deep as, can this microservice talk to this other microservice? To John's point, right? This was one of the things we saw as a very interesting behavioral kind of discussion is what should a microservice and or a container do? What is it allowed to connect to? What is it not supposed to connect to? Then how do you enforce that behavior so that somebody can't bypass that and start communicating to something it's not supposed to in, under a zero trust umbrella, right? And exfiltrate exfiltrate my data, right? That is still, that's still, I think, pretty difficult on, on where we are today. We've got enough challenges around the base APIs, let alone what APIs are authorized or not authorized and what are they authorized and not authorized to talk to? And, and these are the challenges that I think are going to continue to create um, some issues for us as, as we roll out these new types of applications. Yeah, I think it's, it's really that reinforcement of that trend that the security has to move up to that layer seven. I think it's been, I, I think it's been true for at least a decade, if not longer, that firewalls are essentially dead in the sense of everyone has, well, it used to have port 80 and 443. Hopefully now they only have port 443. But when we're talking about everything's a microservice and APIs, you clearly just have to have that application layer support or, you know, that traffic is inbound as well as going outbound. So we could say that there is a there is a space place for firewalls to block egress traffic so that you're not just downloading dependencies from random places on the internet. Um, but when you need to talk to these other services, how do you inspect and trust them? And I guess the other thing that I'm going off on a slight tangent here too, when we're talking about security controls, firewalls aren't as easily applicable here. There's also encryption at rest. Um, it's all of the cloud providers have some form of encryption at rest, whether it's um, in their data stores or on the, at the operating system layer, but, and I'm still an advocate for doing so, but if you have an API, that doesn't have any type of rate limiting on it, that has a vulnerability that can just enumerate through users and not even pulling down credentials perhaps, but pulling down sensitive information or even just pulling down email addresses. Um, that's a great way to leak information that has no bearing on whether that data was encrypted on the back end or not because that API is offering a way into that data and a way to pull it out in, in a way most of the time by design and it just so happens every once in a while by a vulnerability that may make it easier to do in bulk or to bypass certain controls like rate limiting that may have been intended to be there yeah so you brought up an interesting point mike about public versus private apis and maybe make them all public you're in product security right if you're designing a microservices-based application, don't you want some segregation of what's public and, and what's private from an API perspective? 
to help just add an additional layer of security to make it a little harder for people to bypass things? I mean, is, wouldn't that be like a best practice around APIs or, or will we see a trend of just every API is open and it doesn't matter? Yeah, so I don't know that we'll see a trend where every API is open, <laughs> um, but we do have, so for example, we have APIs that are ex, you know, explicitly designed for other developers to use. And there are many companies that are, whether they're business to business or business to consumer, um, they have APIs intended to be public. There is, of course, a place for having those private APIs. And the way I see it is also to just a segmentation about what's the population that needs access to this data. So it's it's more of just what does our architecture design look like? And in an architecture layer, do we need it to be public or is it even OK to be public? And I guess when, when I'm, where I'm going with it, that aspect, that second part of it, is that keeping a private API also just minimizes the cruft that you're going to get in your application logs. So you can have strong authentication, you can have good application layer um, security controls, and sure, no problem, just open it up to the internet, but you're just going to get a lot of noise in your application logs that just makes it um, harder to weed through to find the actual signal that you care about. I will go off on a small, I'll keep myself restrained, but a tiny rant about things like, um, we start to talk about like bug bounty or pen testing, is that when, once you start to have public APIs, you also start to get a lot of people poking and probing in, in good faith, but every once in a while you get those equivalent of someone saying, you know, here's a cookie that doesn't have, um, it, you know, it's missing a secure flag on it or is missing an HTTP only flag on it. And it, your application has HSTS um, headers. So it doesn't matter. There's no downgrade attack outside of HTTPS. So just making it public just adds to a little bit of noise about what might be coming in. But um, to answer your question, absolutely, I still like the idea of architecture wise, this is how we're going to segment things. But I think there's also a way to get a comfort level that, yeah, no problem. This is an API that is public facing on the internet. And we're going to do this with confidence that we have some mitigating controls in the sense of when like Netflix's TCP SAC vulnerability comes out, we have some way to respond to it quickly so that we're not going to have suddenly our you know critical um, service is going to have a denial of service attack against it because somebody has some well-crafted TCP packets. So there are still a lot of things to consider, um, but I don't think they have to go that private for the sake of going private. And I know you're not, you know, you know, you weren't going that direction of security through obscurity. Um, I'm coming it from the almost that direction of, um, I like to throw out that Kirchhoff's principle of cryptography in the sense of knowledge of a system shouldn't necessarily weaken the system. So having your APIs public shouldn't make it that much worse, as well as if we switch the conversation slightly, the evil internet in capital letters isn't in fact the only threat out there. Um, there's a lot of concern around insider threats or an internal system that's been compromised. So in a way, I would also kind of point out that there's no such thing from a security perspective as a public or a private API. It's just, does your attacker have access now or is your attacker going to get access tomorrow after a well-crafted phishing campaign and now they're on a developer's laptop to go after your private APIs? Yeah, I agree with that one, right? I mean, internal versus external versus maybe public versus private. But to me, the more you expose externally, the more you potentially open yourself up to either denial of service attack or potentially um, other threats to, to gain entry. And I just, to me, you want to minimize that as much as you can. APIs in their pro proliferation um, being public, to me, just seems like a really bad architectural decision. It's, it's interesting because I think too, there's also that aspect of um, from a DevOps, so leave the security out of it for a second, do you release on a Friday? And with the idea that when releases go bad, do you want your team to be up on a Friday night or over the weekend um, to deal with it? And I think there are good arguments for and against, but the it's kind of implying if you can't, you know, if you don't have confidence in your system to release on a Friday, do you have confidence to release on a Monday? What about a Monday evening? What about a Tuesday? Um, so I think these are really good conversations to have with the teams. And it really speaks to what is your 
comfort level? What's your risk management tolerance for this? And what's your engineering maturity around it? Yeah, I think okay. John, you were going to add to something too. Yeah, it's it's we we sort of moved on. Um, it, it, what I have <laughs> Sorry, seen I is actually. Talking. Oh, no, 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 totally fine. But <laughs> it, it, still, I, I want to sort of put it out there. You know, the public versus private um, APIs. So what I unfortunately do see a pretty good amount of is people who have a published, a documented API, I will say, and then an API that just their web app uses that not their customer is supposed to use because that's special just to me. Right. You're just begging for it. You know, it, 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 come on, you're not fooling anybody. Document it, put it out there, make it open, allow your customers to use it. Um, if, if you don't do this, they might find a mistake, they might find a bug in it, but at least you'll know about it versus um, some of the alternatives out there. And then just really quickly, uh, you know, on those handcrafted packets you're talking about, uh, don't forget those are bespoke handcrafted packets. <laughs> so Exactly. John, on your first point, I totally agree. I mean, it, I've seen this with startups, right? They have an API that is their API to run the app, but then they have a partner that needs to integrate with those APIs in order to get the solutions to work together. And, oh, yeah, we have to update that API or we have to change that API. If you're, if you're building a SaaS platform, I'm just going to say this right now. If you're building a SaaS-based platform, and you do not have a single consistent API for both developing against and for your partners to develop against, you are going to create a lot of challenges for your development team internally because now you're managing potentially multiple versions for different uses and it's going to become a nightmare. And there is a lot of technical debt that will have to be cleaned up if you don't do it right. Just saying. I, th I think it's, it, it sounds like a simple thing to create an API for um or to, you know put that out there but i mean i've been doing those for 10 years and you know it's like i said i'll go and start reading web blogs and i'm um, go oh hey there's another interesting way you could do this i think there's this is an area where you can continue to mature over long periods of time um so maybe it actually makes sense i know it's not simple but to go through at some point in time and you know make that a version two of the api and maybe still support the older one but long story short you always have to be looking at how can you improve these things, right? How can they be made more efficient? Um, how can you return just the data that the caller needs, not the whole record? Um, how can you ensure that your security is flexible? Um, so while well, you might have a model for us today of who's going to be using this, when some crazy idea comes up in six months, is your security model going to be flexible enough to still be able to handle that? Um, authentication, you know, maybe right now you're just doing basic HTTP auth. What happens when you have a partner which suddenly wants to be able to authenticate through GitHub or um, Azure or all these different things? So it sounds like it's a really simple, clean thing, right? Oh, we're going to do an API. And then you start looking at the complexities of this thing and how it's going to be able to, you know, as your backend code modify, is changed and modified or maybe your, your platform or your data structure, your databases, you still have to be able to support out that same existing uh, response, which was documented three to five years ago. There's a lot of moving parts in these things. Um, and that from a security point of view is bad, right? Because usually once you start getting more complex, how you secure that thing becomes a little more difficult. Either, I mean, we've been talking about just authentication authorization. That's that's relatively simple. But how are you going to um, test this as we were talking about, you know, a few minutes ago? How do you discover what's out there? How do you make sure you're testing all the parts of it? How do you make sure that, do you just fuzz that? Or do you, do you take a, a, you know, maybe a day or two, a quarter, and go through, okay, what is this piece we've created? What's going on here? And do some sort of review on it? So it's 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 something which really you know deserves a lot of thought. It it's it's pretty hard to do right. Yeah, I think yeah. I think what we'll have to do is um, take our own lesson in naming and versioning, and we're going to have to uh, wrap up this segment for the day. So uh, thank you once again, Matt and John. Thank you everyone for joining us and all of our listeners. We'll see you next week on Application Security Weekly.